Good morning, folks. My name is Musala, and it is a privilege for me to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, so we are continuing on, uh, in a sense, a series within a series. Uh, within the book of Hebrews, I've been talking about grow up, challenging us to grow up in Christ. And we are concluding that, um, that mini-series within a series today. And we are going to look at essentially the same passage of scripture that we've been looking at, uh, but we will emphasize a various, a different uh, portion of that scripture this morning. And so if you will, can you turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 to chapter 6 verse 12. It reads as follows. About this we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of the instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears stones and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the, sa the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is God's word. And Lord, we come to you and pray that this word of exhortation will have its full work in us and that we would show earnestness and diligence and faith and patience and that we may inherit the promises. We pray this. In the name of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. So, folks, this morning we are going again to ask questions of our text. And the three questions that we are going to ask this morning is simply, what is the problem that the writer is addressing? Secondly, what is the solution that he has in mind to address this problem? And thirdly, how does he hope to motivate us uh, to do what we need to do? And what motives should we have in doing what we ought to do? These are the three things we are going to look at. What is the problem? What's the solution? And how are we to be motivated? But first, by way of introduction, we have mentioned that the writer himself says that what he has written, he says, I have written briefly to you a word of exhortation. So this entire letter, he views it as something that is meant to encourage us 
and to spur us on to love and good works. And we've also seen that the way that is actually put it together is in a series of expositions and exhortations. Ex expositions are meant to tell us what we already are in Christ. Exhortations are now supposed to say to us, now live like it. This is who you are. Live from the inside out. And so last week we, sh we, s we, uh, we saw that this passage that we are reading falls on the exhortation bit of his encouragement, not on the exposition bit, on the exhortation bit. And last week it was, uh, we saw more of the negative side of his um, exhortation. And this morning we're going to look at the positive side of exhortation. The way that I look at this passage, I think of it as a, um, a pep talk that a coach gives in the locker room uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the first half, or the second half rather, of the game. His team has been playing. They uh, have done some good things, but they are not doing too well. And so he's given them a pep talk. Last week, the pep talk was negative. He was saying, Pasop, you're going to lose if you keep playing in this way. You need to get your act together. And this week, he's changing his, uh, the passage we're going to look at, he's changing his tack a little bit. And he's saying to, uh, to the players, he says, you guys can do better. We can do this. Let's go on. Let's go back into the field. And let's do this. I know that I don't uh, look anything like it, <coughs> but uh, uh, in the days of my youth, I was a sportsman. And I remember those days when you sit in the, um, in the half time and the coach is not too happy <laughs> with you and he just lays it on you. And you feel, sometimes you feel completely useless. This guy says, you guys are cows, man. You are, you are not playing well. And in the next moment, he says, you can do this. These guys are nothing that you are playing against. Get back into the field and do better. And, and one of the guys that I have seen, who I, I, I think, at least in this particular instance, was absolutely masterful, was Rasi Erasmus, uh, when he coached uh, the box uh, to our victory. Um, I think it was in 2019 uh, or so at the World Cup. Uh, so he sat in the change rooms, and I don't, recogni I don't uh, um, recommend this language. <laughs> it, was f it was full of uh, expletives and, uh, and other things. But I thought it was absolutely masterful. He started speaking to the young boys, and he was asking each one of them what they are playing for. One was saying, I'm playing for my family. One was saying, I'm playing for this. And having listened to all of their stories, he started talking to them about the nation. And he says, what you are doing here, guys, is, going, is carrying all 60 million of us as the country. And these other guys, they are playing for nothing. Man. They, they don't have problems in their countries. Just get back into that field and do better. And boy, did the boys play. And we went to victory as a result, I, I'm sure, of that motivation. And so this leads us now to the problem. What is the coach seeing as the problem that he's dealing with in his team of these believers? We have said at the very outset when we started this series that it is possible that these guys were Jewish proselytes. These were people who were not originally Jews, who had become Jews. And having become Jews, they've now had the gospel and they've left Judaism. Uh, to, to embrace Christ, and now because of persecution, they are tempted to go back into Judaism. And the problem, I think, that the writer um, pinpoints here is not that these people have a problem of information or knowledge. He sees their problem as fruitlessness, not lack of knowledge per se. There is no earnestness in them. In chapter 5, verse 11, he says they have become dull of hearing. Not because they haven't heard or, or necessarily that they haven't understood, 
but because they have not put into practice that which they have heard. In chapter 6, verse 8, he says, they have received so much knowledge, so much stuff, but they are like a land that often drinks of rain, but then produces thorns and thistles. That is lack of good fruit on their part. In verse 12, he says, they have become sluggish, lazy, the opposite of earnest. They have not done their bit. And if he compares them to their counterparts, the Jews in the wilderness, he says they, chapter 3, verse 8, they are rebellious like those guys. They are disobedient in verse seven, uh, 17 and 18. And they do not have um, uh, saving faith. They do not hear and they did not enter the rest. Uh, and he says that those people in the Old Testament, he says they also heard the gospel. But having heard the gospel, the gospel did not benefit them because they did not hear it with faith. and Therefore, they did not enter God's rest. So the problem here, if, if we don't see the problem correctly, we will diagnose, we will uh, give a wrong remedy. And so the problem here is not that these people are not understanding, but the problem is that they are not doing what it is that they know jolly well to do and they are doing the opposite instead. And so what solution then does he present to them? Uh, let's look at um, chapter 6. He says, he gives them three things. He says, let us leave. This is the first encouragement. He says, guys, come on. We can do better. He says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. I like the fact that he calls it a doctrine, not doctrines of Christ. There are many things that are said about Christ in the Bible, but all of them come to one doctrine of Christ. And he says, guys, you know the gospel. You know the teaching. The word doctrine simply means teaching. What the Bible teaches us, the basic teachings of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you know it, let us leave it. And, and, and as we said the other day, by leaving, he doesn't mean that you go, you go into maturity by abandoning the gospel, but what he means is that you need to use it uh, to cultivate your capacity to discern good and evil. You need to practice this thing. You need to allow the doctrines of Christ to transform you morally and spiritually so that you do what it is that is contained therein. And then secondly, he says, let us go on to maturity. So you leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, you go on to maturity, and negatively, he says, not laying again the foundation. This, let's not keep laying the foundation. In chapter 5, he speaks about uh, the basic principles of the oracles of God. Now in chapter 6, he's talking about the elementary doctrine of Christ. And then again, he talks about the foundation. He says, please, let us stop this thing. And he uses the word again twice. In, in chapter 5, verse 11, he says, you still need again the basic oracles of the word of God. And now he's saying, let us not lay again the foundation. And as I have said, it is about doing what we have heard. It is practicing, it is hearing in faith and living out a life of obedience, a life of moral and spiritual transformation. I again want to emphasize what I said before. And, and this is interesting to me because this guy refuses. He absolutely refuses to progress in his teaching to mature stuff. 
um, unless and until his hearers have done what he has spoken to them about earlier. He, he thinks that the goal of teaching is application and moral transformation. And even if you can say to him, I know all of that, I know all of these teachings, I can uh, recite them back to you, he, he will say, okay, but let's look at your life. And if your life doesn't bear out the truth of what he has spoken to you, then he refuses to teach. He says, I'm not going to, I'm not going. I'm not going to progress to other things until I see change in your life. In fact, he says, it has become hard for me to explain to you because of your dullness of hearing. So for him, teaching is connected with life transformation on the part of the hearers. He does not communicate to inform the head. He communicates to see life transformation. And of course, that life transformation will come through the head. You must hear and understand. But the head really just holds the truth long enough until the heart is transformed. And it is filled with passion and love for Christ. Uh, and then the life itself becomes transformed. So the problem is not head knowledge. The problem is fruitlessness. And so he says this, the, 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 the solution is that we need to put these things to practice so that we can mature, so that we can go to deeper truths of the word of God. I wonder, I just wonder, what would happen in this church and in churches across our nation, South Africa, and the nations of the world, if Bible teachers were to refuse to go on to other stuff unless and until whatever basic they have taught is actually lived out in the lives of the church. And that might be an interesting principle to have. Because sometimes we teach ourselves to inactivity. We know so much and do so little that sooner or later you become paralyzed and you become unable to do anything because of the knowledge that you have that you have not used in your life. And what are these basic principles? What is this foundation that he is talking about? Uh, we will see that he gives this, this uh, foundational doctrines of Christ. He gives it in two pairs of three, and that is how we will briefly uh, look into it. First of all, the first pair, in, um, I will read from verse 1 again. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation and what is that foundation? He says this foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. That's the first pair. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. It's interesting that he says uh, re not repentance from sin, even though I'm sure this is what he has in mind. But he says repentance from dead works. Um, Whatever it is that becomes so fundamental to our lives that it controls our sense of identity and the things that we do to try to commend ourselves to other people and to try to commend ourselves to God, it only leads to death. And he's saying you need to repent from those things. Repentance from dead works. And not only should you repent from dead works, you need to have faith towards God. These two things are two sides of the same coin. You do not have saving faith if you do not have repentance. And you do not have true repentance if you do not have faith. There is false repentance where people are sorrowful and they are crying and they are flogging themselves and they are doing and saying all manner of things. But that repentance is false because it doesn't have faith in it. 
And some people have got a false confession of faith where they say all the right things about Jesus Christ. But in their hearts, they have not repented. They are still holding on to certain things that they are hoping these things are going to commend them to God. Or they are just holding to those things because those things are giving them satisfaction. And uh, they are proving that their true fundamental sense of joy and satisfaction is in those things and not in Christ. And in both those cases, the whole thing is false and we need to turn. This is such a fundamental teaching. It is in fact so fundamental that it started the Reformation. Uh, back in the uh, medieval uh, Catholic teaching, they were using the Latin Vulgate, the, 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 the Latin translation. In fact, it is still today the official translation of the Catholic Church. And that word that says repentance in Latin is called poenitentia. Uh, and it has come to be translated into English as penance. And so the church understood this teaching, repentance from dead works and faith towards God, it understood it in the sense of doing penance. And by doing penance, they were looking at two things, confession and satisfaction as administered by the priests. And they were saying this is a fundamental doctrine of, of, of the church. You need to do penance. And to do penance means that you must come to the priest and you must confess and he's going to do satisfaction for you and you are going to to have absolution for your sins. And when Martin Luther, God was dealing with him, and a guy called Erasmus of Rotterdam uh, translate, managed to get translations of the, the original Greek and published it in his Bible that had both the Greek and the Latin side by side, Luther saw that the word repentance there is from the Greek metanoia. And Fundamentally, the word repentance or metanoia means to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your behavior. And you do so by turning away completely. There's a 180 degree change that happens in your mind, attitude, and behavior. And, um, and when he saw that, he says, no, no, no. Repentance has got nothing to do with sacraments. It has everything to do with the changing of the mind and the heart. This is done by God's word and we turn towards God and uh, it has to do only with God. And that became the spark of the reformation. True repentance. Turning away from the things that you used to find satisfaction in and looking towards Christ. And so we tend to look at repentance in the negative light and faith in the positive light. Let me explain. Repentance, we think of it as something that you do away from. You repent from something. And faith is something that you do towards something else. You repent from dead works and you put your faith towards God. Uh, and, but, but actually, in the Bible, particularly in Paul, you would see that these words are used interchangeably. For example, in Acts chapter 20, verse 21, Paul says he preached to both the Jews and the, and the Greeks. He says, I preached to them repentance towards God in our Lord, um, uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. So in this, in, this, in this case, he sees repentance as, as positive. Not repentance from, but repentance towards God. And then he says, and faith in Christ Jesus. We become united with God and reconciled to God through faith in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something that we do as the Catholic Church emphasizes. You do penance, but repentance is you are turning away from yourself and you are looking to Christ and what he has accomplished 
so that on the foundation of what Christ has done, you become reconciled to God. And then, so the emphasis in this first pair is on justification. You are declared to be in right standing with God because of the merits of Jesus Christ. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. The second pair, he calls it washings and the laying on of hands. And, and here a lot has been said, uh, the word washings is baptismos. And, and so some have said that this is talking about baptisms in the Christian sense, and that is possibly true, and I have taught that previously and continue to do so. Uh, but it is possible that because he's talking to the Jewish proselytes, that he is focusing more on the ceremonial washings of the, of the Old Testament. And he's now uh, giving a Christological focus to those things. You would remember, and these guys, if, it, if indeed they were proselytes, if you were a proselyte, a proselyte means somebody who was not born Jew and who now wants to convert to Judaism. That person is called a, a, a proselyte. And if you were a proselyte to Judaism, they, they had a baptismal pool. And that baptismal pool had steps for you to walk in. And as you walk in, you get covered in the water. And then you walk for a couple of seconds inside the water, completely covered by the water. And then the other side, you get into steps. And next to the steps, there's a rail. So you hold on to the rail and you walk in and are baptized as it were. And not only this baptismal pool for the proselytes, but also all the ceremonial washings of the Jews were meant to show them that God is holy and if you are to come to God by converting into Judaism, you need to be washed, you need to be cleansed, you need to throw away sin. And even as a Jew, washing your hands ceremonially and so forth and the various washings they did were supposed to show them their sinfulness and God's holiness and how they need to get rid of sin in their lives. And so washings are symbolic of um, progressive sanctification. It's not so much justification, which comes by repentance and faith, but it is continued sanctification. There is definite sanctification that we have at repentance. When you, re when you repent, God washes you. But there is also progressive sanctification that we do throughout our lives. And the laying on of hands, again, I think he's focusing more, given that this letter is to the Hebrews, people who are, who are familiar with the Jewish customs, he's saying to them, there is a symbolism of the laying on of hands. There is empowerment there is blessing we remember the stories of um, jacob blessing his two sons and crossing his hands and how powerful the right hand was and the symbolism of um, of the laying on of hands and also the priests used to take a goat and lay their hands on this goat and this one of them two two goats one was a, what's called a scapegoat once he has laid his hands on this goat, he sends it into the wilderness to be devoured by wild animals. And secondly, they take the other one, and that one was slaughtered for the sins of the people of Israel. And so that is symbolic of a substitutionary atonement. That something is dying on behalf of the sins of something else. And so the writer must be saying, look, the importance of Christ as our scapegoat that was crucified outside of the city gates, but also as the sacrificial lamb that was slaughtered vicariously on our place and for our sins. And then lastly, the last pair, and I know that I've done a very brief uh, treatment of these things. Third pair is resurrection of the dead 
an eternal judgment. I think, as I've said, the first pair, repentance and faith, is focusing us on our justification. We are declared righteous before God. The second pair is focusing on our sanctification. We, are, we need to be cleansed and continuously cleansed before God throughout our lives. And then the, th- the last pair, repentance, uh, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment is supposed to focus us um, in service, not just in personal purity, but holiness in a positive sense of doing something good for other people. And he does this by telling us that, listen, you are accountable. And you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That is the resurrection (coughs) of both the just and the unjust. And both are going to stand before God. And both are going to give an account before God. And therefore, you need to live a life of service for other people. First Corinthians chapter 3, and we hopefully come to it, verse 10 to verse 17, it speaks about uh, the, the different kinds of works, the way that we build on this foundation of Christ. And he says there are two kinds of people, two kinds of works that are going to be revealed at the day of judgment. He says the first one is gold, silver, and precious stone. The second one is wood, hay, and stubble. He says every man's work is going to be revealed on that day and is going to be subjected to fire. And if you have lived a life of service, um, that service is going to be shown. Is it the kind of service that is gold, silver, precious stone? In that case, it will survive the fire. Or was it wood, hay, and stubble? In that case, it will be burnt, but you yourself will be saved. But you will suffer loss if your service came out of wood, hay, and stubble. And this leads us to our third point. How are we to be motivated and what must motivate our service for the saints and service towards God? The most important motive is the love of God. If whatever you do, your service, is not coming out of the love for the people of God, that God's love um, elicits out of your own heart, then whatever it is that you have done, regardless of what it is, it's going to be burned. It's not going to be gold, silver, or precious stone. God wants us to serve others, but God wants us to serve others out of love. That is the motive that we should have. Look at verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10. He says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. He says, God sees your work and God sees your love. But w- what is that love towards? He says, It is the love that you have towards his name. What does God's name represent? It represents all that God is as revealed in his word. He says you have shown love towards God as he is revealed towards his name. And that love that you have for God has issued out in love towards the saints. And it has issued out in work for the saints. And the motivation for everything that you are doing was love. And if your motivation for doing whatever it is that you are doing for God is love for God, and when you're showing love to people, it is because you love God, then your service is going to pass the test of fire. And you uh, will be rewarded. And that is the second motivation. Why must we sacrifice? Why must we give? We must do it motivated by love, but we must also do it motivated by the fact that we will be rewarded. And I want to read that portion of scripture 
uh, a little bit more. Um, I will read it very briefly and then conclude. It says, according to the grace of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he, is, he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest or revealed or clear or evident for the day will disclose it. What is the day? That's the day of, of judgment. Because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So we see here that we are to be, Paul is bringing this as a motivation. He says, guys, come on. Serve. Each one of you. God has given you gifts. And you are supposed to build on the foundation that God has given. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. And he says, and if you build well, you will be rewarded. And if you don't build well. And again, I want to emphasize that it is not so much about quantity, but it is about quality. It's not about how much work you have done per se. But it is what motivated that work? That is what makes it gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw. And so I want to conclude with this thought. How much do you know about God? And how much are you actually putting into practice of what you do know about God? God is not so much interested in how much you know, but how much you truly know is borne out by what you actually do. I want to encourage you to look at your life. If you have had, like certainly myself, I've had far too much than I'm actually doing, then there is an, there is a, there is an element of repentance that we need to do. And we need to look at ourselves and say, God, give me grace. Help me to see your name, your true nature as it is revealed in the Bible. Your great love towards me. Because once I see that, it will motivate me to love other people. And, and then ask God to give you an obedient heart and a hearing ear. Ask God to give you a heart of faith. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you that you have been so patient with us and so gracious to us, so loving to us. You've continuously opened things to our eyes, even though we haven't always done in line with how much we know. And we pray that you'd help us and, ch and, and help us change that today. Help us to have hearing ears and obedient hearts. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.